The whole conversation is going to be about how unforeseen circumstances that can delay or halt developments can be helped by innovative lending and dynamic attitudes from all parties in the transaction chain. What events or circumstances could delay or halt property developments over the next 12 months, in your opinion? And how are you, as part of Avonmore, uh, planning to mitigate against this? One of the things we're seeing at the moment is a slight gap between sellers' price expectations and what developers are often pre prepared to pay for a site. Um, so if you're a developer, you know, you've know you got GDV risk, you've got build cost risk, and so you're probably pricing in a slightly higher margin or being conservative in your figures. Um, as a result, the land value you're prepared to attribute towards land may be less than what a seller is currently thinking their land is worth. Um, and I guess if you've got that disparity emerging because you've got sellers who, who've got a low cost of finance, aren't under any pressure to sell, you've got that kind of price gap emerging, then transaction volumes can fall away. And then as they fall away, naturally, the development falls away off the back of that. The other one, I guess, is the um, equity investment appetite. So if we look at the uh, development capital structure, you've got the debt and you've got the equity. And I think the debt market is still very strong. There's a lot of demand to fund developments. But um, on the equity side of things, you've got um, there's always that potential, given where the market is, that capital can pull away. And if you have that, then you don't have the full capital structure to develop. Um, and then naturally you're not going to be able to carry on developing or <coughs> there won't be as many projects going on. Investor sentiment is really declining and that's creating a lot of pressure on us. We, we've crowdfunded a lot of projects and so when we've got hundreds of investors, when they start becoming nervous, that also creates uh, pressure on us as developers to try and make them happy and uh, to try and educate to them and explain to them why this is happening. Yeah, cost absolutely is, 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 is important. We are a, we're using modular manufactured units to put on top of buildings. Um, you know, that, you know, the viability of that is a challenge, and particularly when the modular manufacturing market is fairly nascent in its delivery, or in, in its development rather. So you know, finding a supplier who we can be confident in that can deliver at scale, at the right quality, at the right cost, has taken a lot of work. I think on the, on the larger, larger value developments, right, when yeah. I say the individual units have got, are, are at the top end of the market, you have to uh, allow, and developers are doing this anyway, you have to allow a longer sales period to do that. So it's not saying they won't sell, it's just saying they'll take longer to sell. And you put that into a, into a development uh, facility, and what that does is it eats up a lot of interest at the back end, which all that does is impact on what you can lend at the start, yeah. somebody, which means more investment from the client themselves or their investors behind them, and that's impact. And if the investors behind them are a little bit nervy about the market, it's, it's, it's just that, that continual circle of, of what you do. And I think you'll see more and more lenders allowing that longer sales period, which is going to require that, long, that higher level of, inv of uh, investment at the outset. Just from a practical standpoint, as a developer, that can mean that we're getting up to four different facilities. So we're taking on our bridge to buy the property yeah. and get to the planning stage, which sometimes can take up to three years. We're then having to go on to the next stage of facility to undertake the development and, uh, and the land loans. And then we're having to look at products for exit. Mm. And sometimes then we're having to go on to buy to let type mortgages in order just to hold the, the finished projects yeah. until we can sell them. So all these costs add up. You hit the nail on the head with the planning because the, yeah. the time it's taking, I hate to swear in front of developers, but planning process, it's a nightmare, isn't it? It's taking so long to do. So your costs of just sitting on that site or waiting for that site are just, just totting up all the time. And it's just, it's just taking it off bottom line. I think that's where the apex model is quite effective. Exactly. Because you're essentially there, what you do, there. when you're up there, yeah. you, you also, and there are a number of positive moves in terms of the planning review that are going ahead, not least permitted development rights for airspace development. Um, but you're not, you're not sitting on the land, you're not getting land funding. Now we're hopeful that with working with local authorities, and we are close to you know, hopefully signing up with one or two, um, we will have the support of their planning departments because we are developing kit that is going to benefit their communities. We've had a scheme, we had to restructure it yesterday, oddly enough, um, and one of the, um, one of the solutions was as soon, we've had to rephase the first phase into two, phase one A and B. <laughs> um, and then as soon as um, phase one A is complete, we're then um, exiting it straight away because there is so much uncertainty on how long these years, and these, these are mid, they're not first time buyer homes, they're sort of second time, which is probably the strongest area of the market currently. Um, 200,000 a unit in, in Greater Manchester, it's, it's about right. Um, strong sales indications, but nobody still, we just do not know. 
So the funder has got extremely nervous about funding the whole of phase one. So we've had to rephase that. And then we're we've already authorised the facility to buy that phase out so that they can fund it and then it'll just roll into the next. Um, on the legal side, the common issues that come up are to do with the planning process. So we've been talking about that for about 10 years now in terms of streamlining the process and so on. And there are some very unsympathetic planning authorities um, where actually they, they do need housing, affordable housing in the area and other, and other types of housing as well. I think on the other side, in terms of uh, amending and restructuring facility agreements, um, that's largely due to cost overruns, I think, at the moment and, and, and delays. Sometimes sponsors are maybe drawing up business plans and appraisals which are too aggressive um, to start with. And now there's, um, we're much more enlightened now in terms of what the sales period is really going to be like. So actually, we can reverse engineer that into the facilities. And I think it comes down to yeah, what you were saying right. about yeah. the aggressive yeah. business ca cases that we put forward. We never <coughs> think we're going to hit the, the bare case, the base case. We always think that's really far down the line. But actually, what we're finding is, unfortunately, we're hitting that base case. So we're having to shift our uh, best mid and bear case right down and uh, just it's a recalibration. One of the challenges for developers and I'm talking for you guys I think most developers now have to find the way to improve planning when they purchase the site from mm. from the clients. Yeah. I think gone are the days of buying a ready-made <laughs> scheme just to develop. And the closer the broker stays with that developer the easier it is from a funder's point of view in terms of liaising through and managing expectations both ways. That's, it's the in proper intermediary role, really, of managing the expectations of the It's advisory yeah. rather than brokering. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That, that's yeah. exactly what's needed in the market Absolutely. Right now. The SME developers have had a pretty tough time with this, and I know they've, you know, some are given support, but, and they do, a number of them I know of, certainly in the airspace uh, environment, who have tried to play in the airspace environment, have not got their models right because they've been too ambitious in terms of what they think they can actually sell kit for and what they think they can actually pay the vendors. You have to be disciplined about yeah. what you do. This is definitely a tale of two halves here. Yeah. So if you speak to the Canary Wharf Group, if you speak to, I, I spoke with Tony Pidgeley of Barclay yeah. Homes yeah. recently, and I tried to convince him how hard it is for SME developers, and he was in utter disbelief because yeah. he said, we're having a great time. <laughs> we're buying, we're, we're able to sell, we're doing all of this, we've got great uh, pipeline, yeah. but the reason is, Vendors now want to sell to the big house builders. Yes. Why, why sell to a boutique developer when they've got the name of, of yeah. Buckley Homes behind them? It's not just even getting the decision that's slow. It's, it's getting sign off of yeah. pre-commencement conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That can take three Absolutely. months to six months. Mm -hmm. 12 it's, months. Exactly. It's ridiculous that, that the developers will submit the required information yeah. and then it will sit on a, a council officer's desk for weeks and weeks mm -hmm. and weeks without being looked at. Are there less lenders doing um, pre-planning lending then at this point because of these issues? I think so. I think the planning issues. risk, not necessarily the fact that we don't doubt the decision will come through, it's when the decision will come yeah, through. Yeah. And I find the funders doing both, yeah, i.e. pre-planning yeah. and yeah. then rolling into development. There are some that will do it, but there's, there's a very small small part of the market. How, how do you judge when your loan is going to be, if you're doing a pre-planning loan facility, mm -hmm. when is that going to turn into a a planning's in place development facility or it's repaid via one of those because you just don't know you know so how's this interest going to work is the client going to service it or we expect it to roll it up over that period how, how is that really going to work and often you've got 12 months on that particular product and then they make you start paying the interest sure. and that's yeah. a big hit to a developer when you've got a number of sites and you're yeah. having to actually physically pay the interest mm -hmm. every month because you're waiting for planning when we're lending to a developer we're technically secured we technically have a first charge and it it's a secured loan, but actually if you look at the, the development process, a big part of it in the middle from the time you're probably about 30% drawn to 80% drawn, you're secured, but you're probably at haircut territory. Mm -hmm. So actually we do, there is this kind of, there is an unsecured element of what we're lending. And what I mean by unsecured, I mean it's, it's we're driven more by the, the person who was, who's sponsoring the deal, the developer, the broker, the contractor, that entire team is actually part of our security, if you like. I think they've always been there. Um, it was one thing that saw me through the recession was developer exits <laughs> because nobody else was buying. And it was literally how I survived. Um, it was just packaged. It was called something else. It was just straightforward limited company buy to lets. And they've just, the, the funders have got onto this and realised that there is a market for it. It's always easier to deal with potential extensions 
six months before they're needed. Yeah. Because you say, actually, we can see where it's going. We're going to make allowance for it now, mm -hmm. rather than, oh, my God, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, we just got to put it, that's not, the, that's not, that's no good for anybody. Some of the conversations are happening too late in the, uh, in the programme, exactly. actually. And if they, if they take place at the beginning, so you have a development facility which kind of rolls into an investment facility and is priced accordingly as well, mm -hmm. then essentially those things are ironed out. But frankly, the decisions take place way too late when, when then they're perceived to be a problem. Well, you should never have an accidental backup plan. Yeah. You yeah. should have a backup plan from yeah. day one. Right.